Hi there, and welcome to Enterprise Software Innovators, a show where top technology executives share how they innovate at scale. In each episode, enterprise leaders share how they're driving digital transformation and what they've learned along the way. I'm Evan Reiser, the CEO and founder of Abnormal Security. And I'm Sam Motamity, a general partner at Greylock Partners. Today on the show, we're bringing you a conversation with Bajoy Sager, Chief Information Officer and Chief Digital Officer at Bayer. As one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, Bayer positively impacts billions of people through technology innovations across healthcare, agriculture, and biotech. In this conversation, Bajoy shares how Bayer is deploying digital farming practices, his perspective on the future of AI, and the best methodologies for partnering with startups. Bajoy, first of all, thank you again for taking the time to chat with us. Super excited to talk to you again. And I feel like every time we chat, I either learn something or I'm inspired about some new technologies. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you again for the invitation. Glad to be here. Will you maybe chat a little bit about kind of your role at Bayer and how you're helping the company digitally transform? So I'm currently the chief information and digital officer of Bayer. Bayer, Bayer, depending on, you know, which part of the continent you're sitting in, both work. So in this role, I see myself in two or three different ways, just simplify it. So one is, of course, leading a a vertical line function, which is about 10,000 people inside and outside counter. Then you have the chief evangelist, cheerleader, coach, agent provocateur of digital across bio. And that's sort of the, the second piece. And then, of course, the external face of bio for all things technology, digital, as it comes to. And that would be my third role. Bears are really interesting and complex business, right? I think it both does more than most people think, right? It serves more customers in more ways, but also is using technology in a lot of ways that most people might not fully understand or appreciate. Do you mind maybe sharing some of the ways that Bear deploys technology in ways that might be kind of surprising to the amateur looking in from the outside like me? I'll maybe tell you a little bit about what we do, and then I'll tell you about the technology because I think that would ground people as they're listening to it. So we have three divisions. And the largest division is crop science. So we support in that way the growers of the food we eat, ultimately, if you want to think about it that way. And the second large division is pharma. This is about the bigger drugs. You know, if you're in cancer, for example, or women's health or cardio. And then you have consumer health, which is all the brands that you have heard and familiar with, Alka-Seltzer, Claritin, Aspirin, etc. And I look at the problems differently depending on which customer segment you are serving. So if you are in the farmer business, how do you do digital farming, right? And what does it actually mean to do digital farming? So the first piece is how do you do responsible farming in a sustainable way? So what we have is, for example, drones over 70 million acres, something close to 73 million acres, where we are collecting data real time on the field. We have satellite data coming in, we actually acquired a company called Climate Corp to get the data so that you can actually predict how much soil moisture is there in one square meter of the land. And then you can actually use algorithms to predict how much seeds do you plant there? How much do you water? What kind of resources do you need there so that you can actually grow, get the best outcome for the farmers in the most sustainable way? And so that's what digital farming is in a nutshell, if you want to think about it, right? Now, this may not be the most critical digital topic somebody would think about until you think about the fact that this is the food you're eating every day. Now, on the other hand, if you are in pharma, completely different problem there, right? So our mission is health for all, hunger for now, which I think all of us can sign up for, I believe, right? There's not anybody in the world who would say, okay, that's not something I'm willing to sign up for. And in the pharma side, it's a question of how do you actually do clinical trials at scale? How do you do in silico drug development before you actually do physical drug development? How do you actually design the molecules in the appropriate way, actually using algorithms before you go and make them in the lab? So that's transitioning because it reduces the time to market in a significant way. Now, if you're a cancer patient, this is life-changing because it's taking the time away from something getting to the market. And these are the things where the technology use is really exciting for me. It's not about the technology. It's really about people on the other side. It's just interesting how significant and in some ways different each of those divisions are, right? You think about crop science, 
uh, which is not a field I think most of our listeners would historically have thought of as being an industry that's digital, yet to your point, has a lot of interesting opportunities for technology impact. Pharma, where you know biotech is kind of one of the core pillars of technology over the last several decades, and then, and then consumer health. How do you structure your team to be effective at managing very different business goals and driving technology and innovation against those different areas? So I have three CIDOs who report into me who are directly embedded in these three divisions, who sit at the management teams at these divisions. So they are really business leaders, if you really want to think about it. And they drive a lot of that intimate conversations every single day. And you have to do that because you have to live that business. You have to live and die by the business to the point where your success is tied to the success of that division. And then I have the, the horizontal bit organizations that support these three vertical pillars, if you want to think about it, right? And what works is these horizontal and vertical coming together. An example of how that comes together is I have this digital hub strategy where, for example, I have a digital hub in Poland. I have a digital hub focused exactly on cybersecurity in Tel Aviv. I'm in the process of building a digital hub in the Americas. And that's where this converges. So you're solving algorithm problems, you're actually solving data engineering problems, but they sit together and you can get a lot of convergence that way. One thing that's you know really interesting about how you talk about this is the purpose of technology is to go help our customers, right? And their customers, right? In the world, right? If you go back to your mission, how do you kind of drive a customer-centric culture in your team to help people think about how technology can be applied to best support customers instead of only you know internal employees? That's the most complicated question for a number of reasons. I'll tell you why that is. Because if I spend most of my time thinking about people, because at the end of the day, and you know this, right? Technology is a people business. It's not a technology business at the end of the day. And what does that actually mean? Within IT, I sort of define digital and IT slightly differently. First of all, I think digital is entirely a purpose-driven part of technology. You are there to solve a human problem. You are there to be a force multiplier. You are there to disrupt an inefficient process to get something solved that you can't solve without those technologies, right? IT traditionally has been a supporting function that enables the current business. So this is sort of how I think about that differently. And, and you need to bring the entire organization along on that journey. Because otherwise what happens is you have some people who are doing these cool stuff and some people not doing cool stuff, and that does not set us up for success. You have to have everybody be mission-driven. So we spend a lot of time purposefully looking at how do we build the teams together? How do we actually get them to be mission-focused? So I don't start a single presentation without first referencing to our mission and purpose. So health for all, hunger for none, I always remind them, you are here every single day because there's a patient at the end of the journey. There's a farmer at the end of the journey. And you're not here to solve the problems of today, but you are. But you're also here to solve problems of tomorrow. And you cannot go solve problems of tomorrow with the tools of yesterday, right? And the third point that I mention very easily is that best is yet to come. And what do I mean by that? Some of the really complex pharmaceutical problems, such as protein folding, would require a thousand qubit computer. Right now, we are playing with 40 qubits. So it's going to be amazing, but we're not there yet. So I don't want people to sort of feel like, yeah, yeah, this is the pinnacle of digital. I don't believe that. I think we are, we would look back six years from now and say, oh my God, those were primitive days. I think this idea of balancing what's possible with technology today versus like where we are headed is such an interesting one. And you just gave a really good example of it. Are there any other tactics around how you balance that with the team? So they're both kind of grounded in the realities of the short term, but also thinking about innovation over much longer time horizons yeah. and time marks. Yeah, so look, there are lots of things that we are doing. But even with quantum computing, we are taking some active measures today, knowing fully well that these are not going to be the final solutions for anything, but we need to get familiar with it. We need to figure out how to write algorithm and code properly for those days because you can't just sort of show up seven years late to the party. You really need to start doing that. So the team actually works on three levels. One, of course, if you're running a big IT shop, 
your license to operate comes from making sure that things run stably. You have a modicum of stability and user satisfaction because people come to work today. They don't come to work for tomorrow. But the second piece is actually building the house while you are living in it, right? So that second piece is the near horizon journey. This is not where you're waiting for the new technology. You know the technology. Now, how do you apply it properly? And the third one, of course, is how do you take these early steps to build up the skills, to build up the competencies so that we can use it when we get to it? And you guys know this already, right? Most of the algorithms that we are playing with in AI, these are from the 70s. We need to catch up. (laughs) I actually wanted to ask you about AI because one of the things we're seeing, you know, on the Greylock side is it feels like we're entering this next era of AI as you have these large models getting larger and larger, having really nice transferability across domains, you know, the ability to pre-train these models and drive really significant performance gains. What are you all doing in this area? And I could think of tons of applications on the pharma side, on the digital farming side, on the consumer health side. So you're absolutely right, sir. Data is maturing. AI is maturing slowly. Not there yet, but maturing. But we also, with that, get data pollution. We get data tourism. What data pollution is, you get a lot of junk data that may or may not be helping the algorithm really predict the right things, right? So that happens as the volume of data goes up, you also get that. Then you get data tourism, which is large enterprise, data traveling from one location to the other because, you know, you just sort of try to move this around, which does not necessarily yield better predictability. but. One of the areas that I'm really focused now on is how do you use AI ethically? Because if you think about it, the algorithms in the beginning of it, we were not worried about that. We were worried about getting the algorithms, training the algorithm to work properly. There was a lot of that sort of early industrial age AI, if you want to think about it. Think Liverpool in 1800s or whatever, right? Now we are getting to that second stage where we have to really think, are we using it responsibly? What are the guard trails around it? And how do you actually build it so that when we put these algorithms in production, they do what we want it to do and nothing more? What are some of the unexpected ways that you think AI is going to transform the industry in ways that maybe people don't fully appreciate today? I will take one from my previous example, right? I mean, previous life. Could you do remote digital surgery one day using AI? Today, nobody is going to sign up for it. And and why is that? It's not just an AI problem. I think when we talk about AI, we sort of misjudge this as an algorithm problem or a data problem. It's also the infrastructure problem. So the way I think about it is, you know, making better wheels so that the trains go faster is different from going from trains to hyperloop, right? To do trains going faster with better wheels, you don't need to change the tracks. You already have the tracks. You just have to build better wheels. And that's sort of the the journey we are on right now. The next evolution for me is how do you go from those trains on the wheels to Hyperloop, where you don't have wheels anymore, or at least wheels the way we think of wheels, and we don't have friction on the wheels, and we have to then build the loop first. Then we worry about, you know, how do you actually have the vessel going through the loop? But that requires infrastructure commitment. So 5G, for example, you know, we talk about 5G as something real, but we all know it is still in its infancy and and 5G has a long way to go. So there is a lot of this edge computing. So I think the next big leap for me in AI is going to be really getting this Hyperloop infrastructure in place so that AI can do what it does in a much faster and inventive ways. And this is also true for the quantum computing, right? Even if we had a thousand qubit computer, how many algorithms are quantum ready right now? Everything that we are talking about, because if you're running the same algorithm on the quantum computing, what are you, what are you gaining? In fact, we're going to get more noise in the algorithm than anything else. So we have to get ready for that. We have to solve the cooling problem. So to me, I think the next few years, yes, we will continue to evolve the predictability of the algorithms. We are going to play with a lot more data, as you said. We're going to get this to the next level. But that big jump is going to be building the the loop 
for the Hyperloop. If you went back 10 years ago, right, and you were talking to a farmer, right, and you're like, imagine 2022, we're going to be able to use drones and we're going to be able to kind of map out the moisture in the soil on a square meter basis and give you everything you need to know to totally transform how you work. They'll be like, what are you talking about, right? Like, that sounds crazy, right? You know, in agriculture or farming, right, or crop science, how does that look different in, you know, five or 10 years, right, in ways that maybe you know, even your average customer say now might not fully appreciate just as I would have been talking about 10 years ago, anything I would say today would be wrong, without a doubt, right? Because we can't really see where these things are going. But I will tell you a couple of things. I mean, so one of them is cell and gene therapy in pharmaceuticals. It's going to completely revolutionize the way we are going to do drug discovery so that we can actually do amazing curative solutions for diseases that have no treatment today such as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. What is that? So, for example, look, with better models, with stronger AI that I was talking about, the ability to do protein folding and visualizations, which we can't do today, we should be able to, for example, treat Parkinson's disease and cure it, possibly. I'm happy to predict, and we'll see how, if I'm true or not, in 10 years, Parkinson's would be a curable disease, not even necessarily a manageable disease, right? So that Right there is a journey that I'm willing to take a bet on and say that's probably what's going to happen. The second piece is as the Earth climate patterns are changing, we need all this data we are getting to build more dryness-resistant crops. We need to actually develop a new set of crops that can be grown with less moisture in places which we won't consider today arable for that reason. because. To feed the world and to continue that journey, you have to consistently evolve this. So that could be that journey 10 years from now. So remember I said it's all mission managed or mission driven. It has to be not just a technology, but it's also how you're growing the crops or how you're treating, how you're curing, how you're designing molecules. That's where I think that that big change is going to be. One of the reasons why Evan and I have been excited to get you on the show is I think you've been a leader and Bear has been a leader in working with startups to drive innovation. And we do have a lot of companies listening to this podcast who want to work with startups, who are working with startups. And so let's spend a couple of minutes just around the texture of your relationship with startup companies. And maybe just to start, how do you evaluate for a given problem when you should think about engaging with a startup or newer technology vendor? Yeah, so look, my own personal belief is that you look for known weaknesses in the way of solving a problem, any problem, right? I always tell people if Band-Aid and bailing wire is the cheapest, best, most reliable way to solve a problem, then that's fine because it's not a problem because there is a role for Band-Aid and bailing wire. Otherwise, we wouldn't be making those things, right? So I wouldn't look for a startup to invent a problem to solve. So in other words, as you say, if you all you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. And that is sometimes a startup issue. Exactly. Because startups are really focused on that one thing. They try to solve it. And a company like Bayer or any other company of, of our size, not every problem is a nail, right? So I look for what is that weak spot? What is the problem that we need to solve? Because it is the bandit and bailing wire is no longer working, right? Today's solutions are also not working. Yesterday's solutions clearly not working. And that's where I go say, okay, what's a startup thinking in that space is? How are you solving that problem? But that's one way of engaging. The second way, this is why I spend a fair amount of time, as you guys know, with startup ecosystems, whether it's through Baylock or Andreessen or any other number, because I want to understand what you guys are thinking of. Maybe I haven't thought about it. Maybe I don't know I have a problem. And then once in a while, I get super surprised by a new way of looking at a problem. I'm like, that's great. Let's see if I can solve that problem. I didn't know I had that problem, right? This is sort of your iPhone problem, as I always call it. Nobody knew they needed an iPhone. Nobody was asking for an iPhone until it showed up. And then they're like, oh, this is really awesome. It solves a lot of issues for me. And that, I think, is the second way I engage with startups. I think the iPhone analogy is an interesting one because one of the things I imagine, and I think I know with you specifically having 
worked with you on different startups is culturally in the organization, I can imagine there's a different approach to working with startups, right? These companies are early. They're working with you often to develop product, develop solutions. Failure rates are higher than working with established vendors. Like, How have you built the culture, not just in yourself, but in the team around being comfortable with taking that risk, being comfortable with things failing for the upside of the potential innovation that these types of partnerships bring? A lot of companies have this disease called pilotitis, right? <laughs> That's a disease where you do all these pilots and it ends over there and nothing comes out of it in one pilot after the other. So you have to treat pilotitis. And the only real treatment is few real wins where you can actually scale and you can say, this approach actually worked. I have a success story. Then people would believe you, right? Until that happens, it's going to be difficult. The other thing, I think, lower in the organizations, enterprise organizations, what gets people successful is the ability to do their work really effectively and predictably in the ways that's been defined, right? So taking big risks doesn't fit into the picture because, hey, I'm going to measure you on how many widgets you built today and how well you built it rather than how many widgets you try to build it and but your initial process is going to be clunky and so your numbers will go down. So people would say, why do I do that? Now, large organizational leaders, in the same thing that I read, they said IQ and EQ plays a big role. So your ability to sort of take risks and manage is, but something about startups which startled me. Startup CEOs have a different profile and it's called job openness. What job openness means, the ability to connect unconnected things in their head. So it's not about solving the problems of today and doing it really well and getting success, but it's about looking at two or three things which are not connected and saying, I see a pattern here. I know how to connect these things and create something new. That's not a quality widely present in large corporations anywhere. And we have to build that. We have to build that purposefully because that's where the disconnects that you guys see. If you don't have that high level of job openness, this high level of interconnected thinking or network thinking, that's another word for it, right? You probably will miss out that opportunity to sort of connect. I love this concept of pilotitis. And I also see it on the startup side. And so I'm curious, like for founders listening to this conversation, how would you advise them to avoid pilotitis? Yes, look, I mean, ultimate question is, are you mission driven? As I was saying earlier, right? I always tell my team, how are you helping the mission? So if the pilot is not tying to the mission, it's a technology driven pilot, you're just trying too many things, then that startup CEO is going to say, what am I doing here? It's okay to pilot something to further the mission because when you fail, you're still learning something. But you're absolutely right. I do see, for example, I love the idea of pivoting, right, in Silicon Valley. You guys are always pivoting, which is nice and it's flexible no, in general because, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying something you guys don't know this already. But is the pivot still taking you within what you know? Are you still doing it with the mission or are you just sort of wildly swinging here and there? What kind of revenue are you chasing? Are you chasing the revenue you want to truly grow or are you chasing the revenue because it's going to plug a leak you have today? And if you think that through, I think you will make the right decisions. There's a lot of startups, right, that are building enterprise software, but are actually not really familiar with how large enterprises work, right? For maybe up and coming enterprise software companies, what would be like the piece of advice you have? What's the one thing you wish like every enterprise software company understood a little bit better to make them more effective in working with much larger organizations? Look, I think the top of the pyramid is, what is the biggest currency a large corporation has, as opposed to a startup? The largest currency you have is trust. It's something where you would say, I have established over the last 40 years, 50 years, trust with my customers. Whether you're an insurance company or a healthcare company or bank, or you pick your customer, their number one thing is trust. Now, if you are a startup company, you don't have existing trust. You're coming in 
hope. So when you're navigating this conversation with a large enterprise company, be aware of what are you asking them to compromise on. If you know that, you can work with it very well. And what does trust mean? Trust means complying to rules and regulations. Trust means meeting customers' expectations. Trust means fulfilling promises that you make. Trust means being accountable to governments in multiple geographies. And that, I think, is where the startups sometimes lose it because and, and you and I have had these conversations in the past because we operate in many different geographies, many different jurisdictions. And if you say this works in Silicon Valley, doesn't mean anything. It may or may not work in another geography for many number of reasons. So I think that's the number when I would say disconnect between startups and large enterprises is startups sometimes think, oh, these guys are slow. These guys are not getting my vision. If only they would just sort of buy into it and give me a chance. But go into it thinking, I am asking them to play with trust. That makes it all sense. It seems like one of the common themes across our conversation is empathy, right? Being empathetic for the customer and really understanding their world and their problems. That is kind of the nature of innovation, both in startups and large organizations. And you know this, right? If you're in cybersecurity, for example, it's not about technology at all. It's really about trust. I know we have like maybe 10 minutes after so. One thing we like to do at the end of the episode is kind of do a bit of like a lightning round just to get a couple like quick hits, right? So maybe some we can kind of transition, you know, to that and I just want to get a couple like, you know, short answers, although they're, I know these are a little bit meaty topics, but Sam, you want to start first? How do you think companies should measure the success of a CIO? Just as you would measure the success of any C-level executive. What is their values? What is their commitment to the business? How are they using their tool of the trade, whatever that trade is, right, to further the mission of the company? I would not measure CIOs any differently than I would measure a CFO or a CHRO. Are there any kind of common mistakes you see kind of newly minted CIOs make that are maybe avoidable? Any advice you would give to someone stepping into that role for the first time? Yeah, so I think one of them is that they come into these roles sometimes thinking that they have to know the answer to every problem in that technology space. You don't, right? Have the empathy and the humility to know that your team is going to teach you a lot and you cannot necessarily know the answer to everything. Maybe to switch to a few personal questions, Bidra, I'm curious, like, have you read a book that you really enjoyed recently and, and what book was it and why? I mean, I read a lot because I spend quite a bit of time, but the book that made the most profound effect on me in the recent time has been Yuval Harari's Sapiens. Absolutely. Without it, I mean, Anne Ola is, is follow up books as well. It's a great book. Yeah, because he's thinking about it very differently. I get a lot of uh, inspiration from it. And Bijoy, maybe as we get to the end here, like any other just like words of wisdom you want to share with, I think, technology leaders that are trying to innovate and kind of use technology to transform their businesses? The only other additional point that I would talk about, which we have not explicitly talked about, is how important reverse mentoring is. Right? If you're a technology leader, spend a lot of time with the people coming into your teams and into your network who come from very different backgrounds, from academia, straight out of school, are coming out of a startup company, and learn from them. Because sometimes, if you've been in these jobs for a long time, you get jaded by, hey, I tried this in 1996, it didn't work, so it's not going to work for the rest of my life, right? So... I get a tremendous amount of joy and personal satisfaction by spending time with the more early employees and how they teach me things that I had not thought of before. Well, Bidra, that's not surprising for me to hear you say, because I know you've always been very humble, very open-minded, curious, and I have to imagine that's helped you become a great innovator in technology. So I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation as well, and it's been fun and a pleasure. That was Bajoy Sager, Chief Information Officer and Chief Digital Officer at Bayer. Thanks for listening to the Enterprise Software Innovators Podcast. I'm Sam Motamidi, a general partner at Greylock Partners. And I'm Evan Reiser, the CEO and founder of Abnormal Security. Please be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find more great lessons from technology leaders and other enterprise software experts at enterprisesoftware.blog. This show is produced by Luke Reiser and Josh Meir. See you next time.